Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 724. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. Today's March 22nd, 2022. All right, welcome to another exciting show of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could join us. This is where Kevin and George sit down in front of the web cameras here in Central Florida, press the record button, and we talk about all things Anglican, Christian news, politics, wars, um, elections. We'll talk about anything because, you know, we bore ourselves. George, how you been doing? I'm exhausted. Uh, this cl- The never-ending property closing. We were scheduled to buy our home on March 1st, It'll be our first house after uh, 37 years of marriage. I, I've lived all these years in uh, rectories and uh, rented accommodation. And it's been pushed back now to April 1st and all the banks and all the drip, just every little thing that, uh, I don't want to say could go wrong, but uh, my goodness, this is a very stressful process. And I have so much sympathy and empathy for you, George, because it took us 30 days to close on our last mortgage as well. And uh, Jill and I and our two, you know, two of our three kids and a dog and a cat sat in a Motel 6 for 30 days waiting for Bank of America to finally say, well, your credit's perfect and everything's perfect and you finally have the right flood insurance to live on the shore. And so I, I have so much sympathy for you, and I know the level of stress that, you, that you're going through. So uh, people, please keep George in your prayers as he uh, goes to final signing in a week and a half, you said? Yes, a week from Friday. And, wow. it, and because I'm a bit melancholy, I basically think of all the problems of life. And uh, the smart people uh, who I read and about the ministry and whatnot tell me that I'm going to lose a third of my people. From, for COVID, and I'm afraid they're right. Uh, the snowbirds haven't come back, and after basically sorting out, uh, we've lost about a third of the people through death or moving, and unfortunately, some people just realize they don't really need to go to church. Uh, they're happy at home watching it on TV. I find it interesting that right now we're on, on the cusp of war right after this pandemic, and I would hope that this would be an opportunity for people to uh, serve their angst and anxiety at the altar, to uh, take you know these feelings of uncertainty, this inflation, all that's happening around the world, and not do it uh, in the mess in their homes, but to take this as an opportunity to reintroduce them to church, to worship, uh, to to the life of of, of the kingdom. I've uh, spent most of my time on pastoral issues, and I find that uh, my competition these days is Peloton or uh, TikTok. Really? Things that, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, in other words, people are relieving stress and approaching spiritual issues <laughs> through exercising on their machine <laughs> or uh, playing with videos. and. What is actually frightening to me is I'm seeing in the less connected members a rise into what I would call paganism. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a, I have an older woman, very faithful. Her daughter basically is a Christmas and Easter person. The daughter has drifted off these last two years into uh, these uh, Sophia spiritualist, you know, things that. Uh, I really, I believe, are demonic and satanic. I think these are the times that Satan snaps up the unaffiliated and those who really are not firmly planted in Christ. Oh, absolutely. And I'm see, I'm, yeah. I'm seeing it, and it, mm-hmm. it, well, perhaps it's just because the stress of the closing. I, I see bad stuff, not good stuff. But, gosh, there are a lot of people hurting out there, and they're not responding to what I believe is the answer, which is Jesus Christ. They're responding to physical exercise or consumer consumerism or faux spirituality um uh you know yesterday what was it yesterday or two days ago is the uh spring equinox and uh, you've got a thousand plus people at stonehenge at 5 30 in the morning celebrating you know the uh 
start of spring in druidical fashion. And I'm thinking, you know, these poor people are so deluded. Um, it's one thing, you know, well, I actually don't even think that's, I'm not even going to make any excuses. I just think going down that road is a quick road to destruction, moral destruction, human destruction. And this is the time when we could have used the church, but the church mm -hmm. has lost its voice. Um, it's lost the benefit of the doubt of culture of, of the times. And there's just no way the church is going to immediately recoup uh, its stature and place in the world. The world is so eager to accept these Stonehenge ideas, this woke idea, the um, the the uber liberal uh, all things being equal uh, jargon, that the the church has has lost it for now. And I don't know if we need to enter a time where uh, we have the the Benedict option and we just close down for a while, or if we we continue to fight this. On a, on a cultural level I, I don't know what the future is for this but it is very difficult to watch as a as a christian from the 80s when uh our our hope was oh we'll have a celebrity become a christian and, and that'll solve our issues well our issues are so much more difficult now george uh indeed mm. uh, and time's difficult um let's move on to some news here oh people are asking about my eye i went and got my eye tested and my left eye with enhancements, I paid for the upgrades, is 2015. Not 2020, but a little better. So uh, that's kind of cool. Uh, kind of worth the extra cost. And they're going to do this eye on April 7th. So I should have full vision uh, in both eyes sometime next month, I hope. We'll see. And then I start driving again. It's time to, mm. to, to take the rig out of the park and uh, start traveling the country. Let me pull up the show notes. Um, show notes. Oh, hymnal update. So one of the stories we discussed last week with the uh, ACNA wants to uh, have their own hymnal. Great. And you and I were like, well, you know, starting a hymnal now, uh, are they going to include kind of the, the modern songs, the, the songs with too many choruses and um, too many vibes? And we got a response from one of the heads of the uh, ACNA hymnal committee and uh he kind of said uh oh no you, you got it all wrong mark williams wrote us and said uh yes they're going to introduce a new hymnal but they're not going to be including uh mon <laughs> modernity songs so to speak george yeah we we love doing this we stuck a stick in an anthill and boy did ev this caused grief poor mr williams he probably had a thousand emails from people <laughs> Demanding that uh, the old rugged cross be in it, or that demanding that, uh, you know, these 20 stanza praise and worship songs be out. And poor guy, this is a th I, thankless job sometimes because people will have their favorites and they're going to get angry if the favorites aren't there and they're going to get angry with stuff that they don't like. Mm -hmm. And and so Mark Williams uh, and the committee are taking the high road and going to, for aesthetic quality, musical quality, and theological rigor. Good. Um, but so in, pri in public, they're being positive, upbeat, but I'm sure they're mad as hell that we stuck a stick into there, <laughs> into the well, anthill yeah, and the, messed the, things up. Oh, I don't know. I think we draw attention to things that we have questions about. And we have the same questions that I saw on Facebook. People saw that there's going to be a new ACNA hymnal, and they're like, whoa, wait a minute. Is it going to have this, 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 and this? And we talked about that. And for Mark Williams and the uh, ACNA hymnal, this draws wonderful attention to it because uh, it's something that needs attention. You need to know what's going on here in the ACNA. Somebody wrote to me asking me if I knew whether they would have lift every voice and sing the... Uh black national anthem that they now that they were going to play at football games instead of the american uh national anthem and you know hymns are can really be politicized oh absolutely uh, yes. and have meanings beyond the plain reading of the text mm -hmm. uh lift every voice and sing is a lovely little song lovely little tune except it's used in by some people as a form of black nationalism uh, to the detriment of American nationalism. Well, it has nothing to do with nationalism. Nationalism is about God, but it's the use people put to music and songs. And 
So it's uh, it's it better them than us, Kevin. I think is how I got to say well, it. Uh, you know, having been an Episcopalian and an Anglican for a long, long time, I can think of probably four or five hymnal songs that are you know pretty much heretical. I don't want to say heretical, but not strong doctrine as far as uh, hymns go, and probably shouldn't be in the in the next hymnal. Um, and so I and, and at the 1998 general convention, uh, with the American Anglican Council uh, was really active at that convention and held almost a parallel gathering for de deputies and bishops, and they would have worship services. And I can remember at one service the hymn they sang was "Onward, Christian Soldiers," and it was the talk of the convention because that's considered a verboten song by the Episcopal PC leftniks, right. uh, peaceniks in the left. And so they, so the, at, so the hymns chosen by the AAC at that meeting were like, um, uh, a mighty fortress is our God, onward Christian soldiers, uh, the Navy hymn for those in peril on the sea, things that, uh, uh, by themselves are non objectionable, lovely, uh, but with, if within the Episcopal political culture world were considered too right wing, too militaristic, too nationalistic. Yeah, okay, well, it obviously will be something we will see in the future. We uh, keep uh, Mark Williams and the uh, ACNA hymnal crew in our prayers. Um, and yes, I'm glad it's not me. Although I love, I hymns. wonder if they're, <laughs> I wonder if they're going to have glory, glory, hallelujah, and if uh, the Archbishop of the ACNA, Foley Beach, a good Georgian, will be singing, will be marching through the vineyards and uh, destroying Georgia and freeing the slave. I mean, wonderful stuff there, wonderful uh, stuff. Uh, all right, so let's talk uh, quickly about uh, Believe Us Too. It's a response to the ACNA Two um, organization that's been out there in response to uh, what's been happening in the Diocese of the Midwest in uh, Mark R Revere, Revere, I can't even pronounce his last name. How would you pronounce his last name? Mark Rivera. R Rivera, sorry. Like Geraldo Rivera. Oh, okay, uh, got it. All right, good. And uh, um, George and I really didn't want to comment on this because it's an active story, but we want to refer you to where to go. And I'm putting a link in the show notes to the Believe Us Too website, and they posted some very critical um, articles about the ACNA2 um, uh, instrument that's being used and how it's being misused. And I thought, hey, we need to talk about it a little bit. But uh, for George and I, this is confirmation to our spidey senses that we've had about the ACNA2 for uh, the longest time now, George. Yeah, it wasn't that we disbelieved, but that we knew we were only hearing one side of the story. And it was hard to tell what was hyperbole, what was hard fact, what was op what was opinion. And so ACNA2, some of its backers ran with it to attack the ACNA on a broad front using the Mark Rivera abuse case as a big stick to beat the ACNA. And it wasn't helped by the ACNA2 the people behind it being drawn from one particular sliver of the ACNA world from the Diocese of C4SO. Um, so there was not disbelief on my part, but rather caution. Now we've got some other pe people who have been abused by Mark Rivera, they allege, saying ACNA 2 has hijacked the whole abuse saga for a, a political agenda greater than the actual incident involved with Mark Rivera. Again, I, I don't know if this is true or false because the ACNA is officially can't respond because they have ongoing investigations. And even unofficially, if they talk to us, we could destroy the whole thing by speaking uh, authoritatively as to what people think and basically ruin the work that they're doing. So I really am, I really don't like this story in the sense that it's hard to get a handle on what really is going on. Well, I think you and I have a handle on what's going on, but we, we sustain our opinions on this until it's been settled in court 
until the ACNA has made uh, public their decisions on this, until the investigation has been done by the third party investigators, uh, because we don't want to hurt it. You know, mm-hmm. there's already plenty of hurt going around, and George and I don't want to add to that on either side in any way, shape, or form. So we want to let the, the story work its way out. And when there's a, a final story, we will certainly let you know. And if there's important updates before that, we will let you know as well. But don't think that because George and I aren't, aren't opinion on it, that we don't have an opinion. We just don't want to cause any more grief than there needs to be right now. Well, I think I, I'll, I think I speak for both of us, but I'll mm-hmm. just speak for me. The issue of child abuse is so horrific, so evil mm-hmm. that it sets me off and so i have an immediate very hard response to that and because i know i'm biased uh, we, we against have- the individual who is accused of this if it's true mm-hmm. hang the guy uh, we both have yeah. daughters and our anger level when we hear stuff like this um is almost uncontrollable uh, I, my I read stuff like this and I feel, you know, visibly and, and spiritually sick when I hear stuff that's, like this. That's, that's when I think I'm happy to live in Florida where we have the death penalty. Yes. Uh, no, yeah. uh, I'm being silly, but the, the point is that I know myself that I cannot write dispassionately on a topic uh, in general of which I have very strong opinions. Mm-hmm. So I'm doubly cautious. Uh, it's not that I'm disinterested, rather that I'm so interested we ha- I believe we have to be squeaky clean journalistically on this and not fall into an advocacy camp one way or the other. So here are silence as being respectful here. Uh, hey, now you and I have discussed this kind of uh, throughout the years, but uh, the Episcopal Church and Putin and Russia have a lot in common. And now that this uh, invasion is going on in the Ukraine, and there seems to be kind of a growing stalemate uh, within the Ukraine, that Russia's not able to advance anymore, and Ukraine is having more and more trouble repelling uh, the invasion, that we're going to be talking about Russia and U- Ukraine uh, for at least the next half a year, if not longer. Um, it's going to affect a lot of things. It's going to affect inflation. It's going to affect crops around the world. It's going to co- affect uh, the cost of fuel around the world. It's going to affect the Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, all denominations. The effects of this invasion are limitless. And I want to talk, for, you know, initially here, just introduce the Episcopal Church into this talk uh, and get that out of the way. Okay, they're there. Let's let's talk about the Episcopal Church. Well, on one level, member uh, former meetings of the. Uh, Supreme Soviet of, of Russia, the Communist Party, where all the delegates clap in unison. Uh, I've seen that done at Episcopal general conventions, and it's really creepy. Uh, so, but oh, a few years ago, and uh, Kevin, why don't you put the link into that show? We jokingly said that the Episcopal Church was doing the work of Vladimir Putin because oh, the Episcopal so, Church. Yeah, put that in. Yeah. The Episcopal Church came out really strong against the XL pipeline and uh, shale uh, oil drilling in uh, New York and in the in the uh, Dakotas. And at the time, we said, "Well, you know, this all leads into the hands of Vladimir Putin and the Russians because they do not want competition for their oil from shale and uh, the Canadian market." And Lo and behold, uh, years later, uh, reporter Glenn Greenwald, I think it was, or somebody like that, an investigative reporter, has basically found that the Russians were bankrolling the environmental movement in Western Europe and in the United States to fight shale oil drilling and production and push green energy, not nuclear energy, Mm -hmm. green renewable energy. Because the Russians believe it's not going to work and the more money the West throws away into windmills, the more oil they'll have to buy from Moscow. And now this has come out in reporting now that the war has broken out. And coincidentally, Rowan Williams, yes, Rowan Williams has made a reappearance on the Anglican scene where he has signed a letter with 50 other church leaders in England 
It's telling the British government to uh, the money it's raising on taxes from the uh, spike in oil prices uh, to use that to invest in green and renewable energies and get Britain out of drilling for oil in the North Sea and out of nuclear. You know, basically, put, you know, put Britain as a pawn in the hands of Moscow because this renewable energy is not going to work or it's not going to work to the extent that people want it to work and you're still going to need oil and gas and if you're not going to drill it you got to buy it from somebody it's either the arabs or the russians oh my well sad is the fact that you know we've we have arrived at this time okay we're stuck in we're stuck in this uh i th- i believe it all started you know not all of it but a lot of it started in, on Ob- under obama Obama said we want to really uh, choose the winners. The winners are going to be solar. The winners are going to be um, uh, uh, wind. The winners are going to be renewable energy. And the the gas price slowly went up, if you remember back then, four twenty five dollars a gallon. And it was made very clear by one of the diplomats from Russia that any time, and this, the numbers are different now, this is, this is eight years ago, any time the price of a barrel of oil goes below 70 Russia is lo- losing money. They can't afford to produce any less than that. 70 is the limit. It's probably 80 now with inflation. And so Obama had the uh, barrel oil for a sweet crude right around 90, 95 for a while. And Russia was losing money or making money at that point, a lot of money. Every time it went under 70, like uh, Trump and uh, uh, Bush, he was losing money. You don't want to give Putin money because it gives him more money for his military and more money for the economy and more money to to boost the ruble and you get to this point where he's making plays beyond he's boxing beyond his weight limit right here his weight class he's not a superpower but he thinks he is Mm -hmm. and here's the mess we have with Ukraine he took Crimea easily because he already had uh, people in the government in Crimea who supported him. So the the effect on the Anglican world of the war in uh, there's effects on the Orthodox world. Uh, that's the sure. most immediate effect in that yeah. for years the Russian Orthodox Church has been the the bear in the room. Uh, nobody really wanted to tangle with them. Everybody did what the Russians said. Now that the Russians are at war with the Ukrainian and the Ukrainian church, the little churches are basically coming out and venting the pent-up anger and frustration with the Russian Orthodox Church of telling them what to do all these years. So there's a massive shift within the Orthodox world itself as the uh, bear is being in danger of being toppled by uh, the other uh, churches. Um, as being the preeminent uh, leader of the Orthodox world. Yes, I know the ecumenical patriarch, all that stuff. No, in the actual reality of the numbers of people and the wealth and this and that, it's the Russians. And the history. Uh, Yeah. And the history, yeah. And now if the, what's going to happen, when this, if this war ends with Russia winning, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, it's over. It will be reabsorbed into the Russian Orthodox Church, both the Moscow Patriarchate already in Ukraine and the independent one. That will all be sucked into the Russian Church. That's what the Russians are saying right now. Uh, Metropolitan Hilarion, who is the uh, head of the Department of External Church Relations, a few years ago says once a church has been established, it can't be unestablished. He's now switching that tune, saying, what, "You know, you can unestablish churches because the Ukrainians should never have been established in the first place." So, if the Russians win, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church is done. If the Russians don't win, the Russian Orthodox Church loses about forty percent of its people and clergy, and there's a, you know, it's not the colossus that it once was, and it will have to spend the next generation. re-establishing links with the other members of the Orthodox world who are offended by Kirill's uh, Russian nationalism. Pan uh, Kirill this past Sunday has been saying that the Ukrainians really are not Ukrainians, they're really part of Greater Rus, 
the Belarusians and the Ukrainians and the Russians are all one people and should have one church. Well, the Ukrainians and Belarusians don't think so. No. And depending upon how the military uh, and military conflict ends depends upon the hit future of the Russian Orthodox Church. So that's the, the Orthodox are in a major bind right now. But for the Episcopal Church in the Anglican world, this is a boon. It's ideal. It's the best possible situation for the Episcopal Church and the Church of England and the Anglican Church of Canada. And it's because at the Lambeth conferences, there's not going to be any talk about homosexuality, about the bad boys, about stuff like that, you know, the Episcopalians and the Canadians have been doing. Instead, it'll be about war. By this time, uh, if, you know, food prices have risen, uh, uh, the number I saw was in Uganda, food prices have risen 17% since the fall uh, because most of the wheat comes from the Ukraine and Russia. And the fertilizer comes from Russia and the Ukraine. If food prices spiral out of hand, we're going to have civil unrest across Africa and in South and in Asia. We're going to have uh, starvation. South Sudan will once again turn into a basket case that has to be bailed out by the World Health Food Organization. And the sort of Anglican wars of the past 20 years are basically of no consequence when you have this major world issues on the on display and it basically gives well-being company the chance to continue to solidify continue to marginalize continue with the agenda they've got because the rest of the church is distracted by the issues facing them at home well i don't want to use the word golden time for the episcopal church in inter-anglican politics in the polity it is um a golden time however the reality of the church is when there's famine you address it you know we, we do want that to be the priority um uh, when there's conflict you address it and um we don't want to you know dissuade you from understanding that it's very important that the church be involved uh with what's going to happen in africa asia and around the world uh if this conflict continues um, well one of the things one of the one of the things we've seen in the past is GAFCON loses members when you have a new primate uh, because the primate, it, West Africa was one of the founding GAFCON provinces. Uh, then it, under the last one, it wasn't. And under the new archbishop who will be elected soon, it probably will be GAFCON again uh, because the Ghanaians from Ga the Ghana, Ghanaians are very pro GAFCON. Uh, if if they've got food riots, if they've got shortages, they're not going to be able to basically hold the line the way, say, the Ugandans and Rwandans have of not taking money from the north. If your people are starving, you'll take money to feed them. And that has, money has been the wedge in the past that has been used to bring on side for the liberals many African churches. It's, you know, that's how, that's what happened in the 60s and 70s. Uh, you bring a few seminarians up to England or America, you liberalize them, send them back, and in 20 years you have a liberal South African church. Yeah. Um, the, I, I don't mean to be, I don't mean to be sounding harsh, but yes, we have the crisis of starvation, the crisis of economic collapse, the crisis of food prices. In the West, they're going. To, things are going to get more expensive. Uh, go to the grocery store and compare your bill from today as to December. But we in the West, we can handle that. We just means we we cut back on our Netflix subscription, or we uh, we we know. can absorb it better. We are further from starvation than any other country. Uh, however, <laughs> the West is good at whining. Uh, I think who is it? Uh, was it Jim, Jim Carville who said, "Never let a crisis go to waste." I forget. Yeah, it was a it was a prominent <laughs> prominent Democratic operative who said, yeah. "Never let a crisis go to waste." Go to waste yeah. And that mindset is something that we see in certain sections of the Anglican world mm -hmm. to use the crises of the world to advance a particular focused agenda that a zealots on this on the gay issue and the transgender issue have. Mm -hmm. 
you know, we can use the food crisis to force, you know, under the uh, Obama administration and now again under the Biden administration, African governments to receive aid have to sign on to gay rights issues. Uh, we recently have seen uh, in Ghana, uh, the Ghanaian church uh, backed a law that would uh, change the sodomy laws from misdemeanors to felonies, not really any real meaningful changes, but a very symbolic change. And part of it was driven by the Ghanaians pushing back against the European Union for making them be gay friendly in their legal structures. Well, Welby condemned them then he backed down, and then the Archbishop of Ghana went up to London, had a nice chat with Welby, and the Church Times reported, well, the Ghanaians have now backed away from their earlier statement. Problem is, nobody has told the Ghanaian people or the rest of the Ghanaian Church that they have backed away from their earlier statement. So the Archbishop of Ghana, Cyril Ben Smith, would tell something to Welby, if Welby's sources, at, if the Church Times is to be believed, but he's not going to say it back home. And why does he do that? To keep open the lines and keep the funds flowing. No, I absolutely agreed. And, you know, that's the, that's the politics we deal with day to day, even in times of peace within the church. You know, a, a sign on the dotted line. All right, a couple more news items. We have new bishops in the ACNA. I thought we could talk about that real quick. One replaces Bishop Mark Lawrence. His name is Chip Edward, Ed, Edgar. And uh, there's another one in the REC. I, and I'm so sorry, I forgot his name. Just, it's a, it's a bad day without coffee. Uh, he's replacing Bishop White. I think it's William White. Uh, yeah. The RE Diocese of the Southeast, yeah. also in the Charleston area. Yeah. And we're seeing a lot of uh, transitions. Pittsburgh's going through a search process. That first generation is leaving the scene in the Anglican world. Uh, bishops and of seminary leaders, and Laurie Thompson is retired at uh, Trinity Seminary, so that that position will be advertised shortly. And I think the good news is that the ACNA is in a great place for a second generation to step in and pick up the reins and move forward. They've successfully moved from being the entrepreneurial bishop, businessman to the corporate businessman. Now, uh, it doesn't, it's the same skill set is not found in an entrepreneur as is a corporate officer. No. But they've been able to grow and transition uh, with the right leaders at the right time. So it looks like a pretty good time for the ACNA right now uh, well, I think in terms good... of its personnel. It has because the ACNA has handled accountability very well. Mm -hmm. uh, when a bishop goes astray and cannot uh, move back within the flock, he's dismissed. Okay, that's the we don't see that anywhere else. Good, uh, and so keeping accountability at the uh, episcopate level and introducing a, a second generation, so to speak, of, of bishops is good for the ACNA and shows the health of the ACNA where the more wise generation, first generation, are willing to step back now. The Mark Lawrences are willing to, to you know, retire and uh, do other things Archbishop Foley would have them do. And I, I'm very encouraged by that. It's, it's a new day for the ACNA. All right, what else we got here news? Oh, I think we covered it all. Just war is unjust? Ooh, yes, Pope Francis. Um, I'm going to have you guys look it up yourselves, but yesterday was Tom Cramner Day, and Tom Thomas Cramner has a very famous quote about popes, and if you want to read that, uh, just Google it. Other than that, uh, Pope Francis has uh, changed, I don't want to say it's a doctrine within the Roman Catholic Church, but the Roman Catholic Church, as far as I can remember, and mind you, I'm only 55, has always supported just war. The doctrine and theory of just war has been well thought, well developed, well thought out. Uh, it's been disputed, and it's in it's never been dismissed out of hand. Right. Uh, in, within the Catholic world, some Mennonite groups and some people like that may dismiss it out of hand, but it's been a respectable. Uh, I don't want to say respectable. It's been a part of Catholic moral and social teaching for a very long time. 
On Friday, Pope Francis gave a speech, and I'll read you the pertinent part. A war is always, always the defeat of humanity, always. We, the educated, who work in education are defeated by this war because on another side we are responsible. There is no such thing as a just war. They do not exist. Oof, that's, that's, that's pretty strong, George. I would yeah, say that's I mean, the strongest Pope language on just war I've ever read or heard. Yeah, and it, if Francis is going, if this is not just rhetoric for the occasion of the Ukraine war, if Francis is really jettisoning, jettisoning the whole doctrine of just war, you've got some issues out there that are quite extraordinary. Um, during the Second World War, the uh, Pope was asked by the uh, conspirators in Germany, is it, is it moral, can we kill Hitler? Is regicide allowable under Catholic Church doctrine? And the Pope secretly, quietly said yes. Um, war against the Nazis is a just war because they are seeking to destroy humanity destroy people they are the evil force the war against communisms have been labeled just wars and so on and so on forth if all of that is now untrue what really is the justification for basically supporting the ukraine or supporting russia or yeah. this or that and the other why why are we not just amish pure pure pacifists when is war not you know it, 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 it i don't i don't I, I i'm sure we'll see some sort of as we always do on these situations when francis says something we'll see the corrections come out in the next week or so but this well, one is quite quite big i would say there's no just invasion but can i not defend myself in war yeah, do, yeah, yeah, and thank God, you know, we haven't taken this too too hard here in America. Otherwise, I would be drinking uh, cheap vodka because the uh, the leader here in uh, the the United States is actually the USSR. Um, we would have lost the Cold War a long time ago if we didn't think that we had to build up armaments and and be the biggest stick in the on the block to beat uh, Gorbachev and the Soviet Union. Yeah, you know. I well, history. Yeah. The uh, this is a topic that uh, people will be debating. People write their theses on this. People are specialists in this field, and for Francis to dismiss it out of hand on basically emotional rhetorical level, I don't think is a very smart move. Well, there's been a lot of emotional rhetorical levels here since the the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I can think of that, and we haven't really spoken to this a lot yet, but Justin Welby talked to Carell. Um, others have talked to uh, Carell as well. They had their responses, George. What are they? Uh, Justin Welby and or initial response was, this is wicked. Mm -hmm. And he, he was personifying Vladimir Putin as the focus of this wickedness. And... Francis was a little, Francis's diplomats were a little more restrained, but then Francis joined the queue and said, this is bad too. Uh, Francis and Justin Welby each had video meetings with Kirill, trying to persuade Kirill to withdraw his support for the Russian state. And Kirill has responded politely, but firmly uh, disputing some of the basic level arguments. Uh, one of the arguments that Kirill believes, and which Putin believes, is that there is no Ukrainian or Belarusian people. They're all part of Greater Rus. And one nation, one church, one state, one people. And to divide them is a plot by the decadent West to import the cultural uh, of death that is so prominent in Western Europe in the United States which they identify as the abortion culture, the homosexual culture, culture mm -hmm. th this, that, and the other, uh, the decadent West. And I'm not here to defend Putin, and there will be that one or two trolls who will say, oh, I can't believe you guys are supporting Putin. We do no, we're trying support. to explain yes. what Vladimir Putin is thinking so you guys who watch 
can get a better understanding of why things are happening. P uh, Vladimir Putin had a massive rally uh, in Moscow uh, last week. So, you know, the press reported anywhere from hundred and hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and Putin used the language, Christian language and rhetoric and Russian nationalism to basically rally the people uh, for this cause. Now, it's what Stalin did in the Second World War. Uh, Joseph Stalin was not a Christian by any means, but he used the, the Christian ethos that is found within the Russian soul, as people like to say. And Vladimir Putin's doing the same thing. I don't know if Putin's a Christian or not. He's been baptized. He worships uh, on occasion. Uh, I, would, some I would call your attention to his fruits, but yeah. Uh, there was an article uh, by Tish Warren Har Harrison Warren Warren Harrison in an op-ed New York Times by an active priest musing on whether or not we should pray for the death of Vladimir Putin. Uh, mm. I don't know. I, I don't read her. No, I. Uh, I know, but I'm thinking. Oh, that's not a good look. We don't want to be the. But uh, well, now, there you go. Well, sadly, this is going to take a long time. And you and I will have to be stuck talking about the invasion for at least six months, if not more. Um, but in this time, the church is called to provide help and aid to the widows and the orphans, uh, to be a place of prayer and a place of worship and a place of sanctuary. And I would uh, call in uh, certainly the ACNA and other churches around the world to do so and uh to love thy neighbor and to love thy enemy uh this is the, this is the opportunity george is that it we're stopping at 41 minutes holy yeah. cow I, I like that all right uh what's your schedule friday you're not signing a mortgage friday are you week from friday cool. week from friday we're taping friday i'm kevin Carlson, and i'm george conger and you've been watching episode 724 of anglican unscripted.